to be ready for this fruit of thought by Matt Lagas. Uh, he's a teacher, or professor, I should say, I'm sorry, at the uh, NHCV in, uh, in Red Hat. And uh, he teaches on the game development for us. He's also a narrative, narrative designer for the with Sensible Studio working on fragments of game. <laughs> and um, he's here to tell you about his way of working with narratives. Yes. Um, he's not only got some theories for you, but he's also got a practical way. He's going to show you how to actually work with these theories. So let's hear it from us, I guess. Cool. Okay. <laughs> Hi. Uh, wow, that's loud. Okay. That's good. That's fine. Um, so, about me. Uh, yes, hello, I'm Matt Haggis. I am Professor of Creative and Entertainment Games at NHTV University in the Netherlands. Um, the logo in the corner. Gotta love logos. Uh, yeah, as, as I was just said, uh, I am a games and narrative designer. So basically, I make things fun or good. Uh, exciting or sad or melancholy or terrifying all the things that we can do with games that's what I try to do both through systems and through stories and I think these two things are a lot more closely related you've probably heard this kind of ludology versus narratology argument <sighs> it's just a loop it's just a loop make great games is really what I always want you to do and I don't care where you start or where you end up just make great games tell good stories so, um, I've been working, for telling stories and making games for about 15 years now. I ran a little indie studio for about seven years. Uh, I did stuff for MTV2. I worked for Electronic Arts at one point. I worked for Rebellion. I was a narrative designer for them. Um, and I'm still making games. Uh, I'll mention it a bit more later on, but I'm making a game called Fragments of Him with SassyBot Studio. I'll say in advance, uh, actually, how many people in here speak English as their first language? Yeah, okay, so for that reason, most of the important stuff will turn up on the screen behind me because I talk really, really fast. When I want to get excited and want to get through stuff, I go very, very fast. Okay, so the important stuff will be on the screen behind me. Okay, so today uh, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to what I think are the foundations of story writing. These are character motivations, a simple plot structure, uh, and the elements of a scene. We're going to be building up a tool as we go through this. Uh, so we're going to build up this big guide sheet, and hopefully you'll have a really strong overview by the time we get to the final slide, which you could then use to uh, make your own great stories and hopefully tell things in a more powerful way. And I'll be kind of highlighting what's different about the way I do it from the standard kind of problem that a lot of games developers face in their stories. So a lot to cover, so I hope this is going to give you a good start in your work. So, stories are sometimes important in games. Assassin's Creed, it's pretty important, I'd say. Call of Duty, uh, depends who you ask. <laughs> some people think it's really, really important because they only play the single player stuff. Thing. Some people think it's completely irrelevant because they only play the multiplayer. So that's kind of a bit of a debatable one. Sometimes they aren't so much. I mean, Grand Theft Auto, for a lot of people, it's about driving around in cars and smashing up stuff. Uh, and that's the really cool thing about it and all the different activities that you can do and that kind of stuff. For, I mean, maybe, I mean, Candy Crush? Is a story important in Candy Crush? There is actually, there is a story, yeah. Uh, but the funny thing is that it's not just about building a story, it's about building a whole narrative world. And every single thing in Candy Crush fits that narrative world. From the, the candy stripes in the background of the menus, the, the fonts they've chosen, the, the, the little sparkles and the, the words they've used all fits this candy world. And actually, as a narrative setting, it's incredibly consistent, probably more consistent than any of the rest of them. So as, as a narrative goes, as a narrative setting, Candy Crush is probably doing it best, which is kind of intriguing, <laughs> since it's certainly not one that we think of as being to do with story. But story, narrative, and plot are three different things. So story is kind of what happens Plot is how it happens, the structure, what I'm going to be talking about today. And narrative is the whole world that it happens in. This has an amazing narrative setting, really not much story. But these are dif different and interesting things to think about. Some games, of course, are all about the story. You get games like Dear Esther. Uh, it's entirely about the story. Some people call it a walking simulator. 
because all you do is walk across an island. But as you go across the island, this emotional journey happens with you. And you sort of wonder at times whether this really is an island or whether this is some sort of internal landscape. It's an interesting thing. That dragon cancer, of course, getting a lot of attention at the moment. Um, really interesting game because that is talking about a family who um, lost their child to cancer based on the real story of the family who were making it. That's all about story. Fragments of Him is all about the story. People have been saying, is it a game? Uh, maybe. Um, it could be described as a puzzle because you've got to take all the right steps to get to the end point. And maybe that's a better description for it. I call it a playable interactive narrative experience, a PINE, because I like the acronym. Uh, but but it, it, we start losing these boundaries of what games are and where stories are and how to tell them in an interactive way. And so it's, these are all interactive experiences, whether they're a game or not, that's up to you. I'm not going to debate that, really. But it's just interesting to see there are games that are completely focusing on stories and doing quite well. Games, interactive, lab. And the games industry is pretty big. This is something I'm working on at the moment, uh, trying to describe it to people who don't know about it. We've got our serious games, where kind of fun isn't important down here, but learning really, really is. It's like teaching new skills. We've got applied games, where kind of encouraging healthy behavior. We've got existing skill sets, but you know you're supposed to be healthy, but maybe you aren't. So you make it a bit more fun to be healthy, and maybe you get more out of that. Then we get entertainment games, what most people think of as games, true games. Um, and they're all about the fun. And then we kind of perhaps move across, I don't know what we call the borderline here, but we move across into what we might call art games, kind of pine, art games, these kind of things, where it's perhaps more about an experience. And it's about kind of contemplation, visual delight, emotions, awe and empathy. And these are all different versions of games, but when we say the games industry, we're talking about something really diverse, very complicated, with all kinds of different funding models. The government and corporate kind of sponsor serious and applied, but over in the arts, the government might get involved, but patronage is there, and down this borderline between kind of applied and entertainment, really, suddenly, we've got this big switch to direct-to-consumer business models. So different business models, different types of things. We've got a lot of stuff going on here. So trying to talk about, are stories relevant to games? Oh boy. What games? Which games? Which, what sort of games are we talking about here? So, where do you start a story? This is one of the big questions that people have as writers. So some start, writers start with the characters. Uh, they create a story by imagining how they would interact with each other. Here's a really interesting person. Let's put a white supremacist in a room with a freed slave. And you kind of go, what would happen next? And that's where they start their story. Um, other people start with a plot and then kind of wonder, who would make those choices? Who would choose to, to go and rescue the, the puppy from the burning building? And then that triggers every event that happens after it. Who would choose to do that? What kind of person? But they start with that plot. They start with that event. Some start with that kind of very, very single event. Uh, like picking up a picture and dropping it in a bin. And I go, who would do that? Why would they do that? What happened before then and what happens after then? And it's just that moment. Something, they, they're, they're, they're sitting in a bath and they, 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 they sit there and go, I don't feel like I want to ever get out. And they go, what happens to that story? And maybe that's Douglas Adams writing some of his books. <laughs> And that's an interesting thing where these little moments can, get, can come into it. And is there a right answer? No, of course there isn't. There's no right answer where to start. But there are tools we can use to help us move on from there. So you still have to plant the seed. That's still up to you to find out what inspires you, what triggers you to go forwards. So let's start building this model. This is the model that we're going to be building today. Um, it's inspired by the works of Ray Bradbury. It's inspired by Kathy Yardley and Blake Snyder. These are various different people who've written about writing and they're writers themselves. Um, we're going to have a couple of different boxes we're going to fill in. We're going to fill them off for motivations, a couple of different things in there. We're going to fill in per scene what happens. And we're going to have the uh, kind of a percentage as we go through our plots going to be appearing down the side here, starting up with our beginning at the top, and we've got the end down here. And along the way, we're going to fill in various highlight points that pop up along the way. So this is how we're going to start up on our, on our model that we're going to build today. 
So, let's begin with motivations. Classic question from, from actors, what's my motivation in this scene? So what do they really mean when they're asking this? The motivation is a reason that anybody does anything. This is a reason to act. Without a motivation, they're going to sit there still. But even sitting there still, they had a reason to not move. So it's why anything happens in your story. What do the people want? Why do they need to take action? This is the most obvious, basic level of where we're going with this kind of stuff. So they come in two different types in our stories. We have the external motivation and we have the internal motivation. Now the external is also called extrinsic and in internal is called intrinsic sometimes. These both mean exactly the same thing. Don't worry about it if you hear a different term. It's still talking about external and internal motivations. Um, both types of motivations are driven by the need for change. Change is a really, really big, important thing in your stories. There is one plot in the world, one plot form, uh, which doesn't have change involved with it. It's a, a Japanese one where there's kind of a scene and then another scene and then another scene which is completely unrelated. And then there's a fourth scene where it turns out they're related after all. And there's no real change in this. It's that the change happens inside the viewer rather than inside the story itself. And that's a very interesting kind of thing uh, in the way that change is necessary in terms of internal perception rather than in terms of the story itself. But I'm going to stick with the classic models here, which is a story is driven by change. Often the protagonist will resist change at the beginning, but embrace it towards the end of the story. And that's kind of part of their development. It's part of the way they grow. And without change and growth, your story feels meaningless. Can't emphasize that one enough. It really does feel completely empty without that there. Your characters must succeed in at least one motivation, the external or the internal, or your story will be awful. I have seen people try to do that. Gears of War basically does it. Uh, a little bit. Uh, they go, oh, I'm going to kill stuff. Oh, the war's going on and I'm still a soldier. It doesn't quite fulfill that promise that the initial setup might have given you. They tried it a bit harder on Gears of War 2 and I think that worked better. And I think they've got internal studio stuff which made all that happen. I don't know. We'll never know because it happened inside the studio. But it's interesting to see how these things happen. So let's start off talking about external here. People need a reason or motive to do things. This is usually something outside themselves. It's something that's triggered them from the outside world. Um, we always want something outside ourselves, usually. So these external motivations are changes that the main character wants to make to the outside world. It's going to affect their status. Uh, also, I want to point out that relationships are external. People go, I want to date that person. That's my internal motivation. No, dating that person is a change of your external circumstances. That relationship externally is an external change. So please remember that one when you're putting these things together. But also you get things like police investigations, solving a mystery, getting rich and famous, getting revenge, getting the ideal job, getting the ideal house, climbing to the top of a mountain, <coughs> killing the ogre at the bottom of the ocean. These are all external motivations. These are things you're going to change in the world around you. So... One classic example, save my wife from the terrorists. You may recognize that plot from Die Hard. Uh, avenge my partner, which is the plot, plot of Beverly Hills Cop. That's the thing that he needs to change. Be with the person I love, Romeo and Juliet. These are classic external motivations. And these kind of variations on these turn up in myths throughout the thousands of years we've been tracking this kind of stuff. And all the stories written these days often have these kind of motivations in them. Defeat generic enemy number three is one of my favourite motivations. That's the story of Iron Man 3. Um, it's a classic. The generic enemy number three is always better than number two and four. Uh, the three, three that's, the, that's the sweet spot, I think. Um, and so on. You, you kind of get the idea. These are changes in the external state, all the status around, in, in their world, the, the world around them. So basically, it's, it's changing either how people see them or how the world is outside their skin. Um, and also, they don't really require any change inside the protagonist. Defeat the enemy? All right. I can do that. Uh, be with the person I love. I'm single, I can go to start dating. It's fine. Uh, avenge my partner. Well, yep, okay, we'll probably have to shoot some people along here, but we'll get there. Yep. You know, uh, save my wife from the terrorists. Well, she's in the building, so that's a start. Um, you know, it, 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 you don't need to grow inside to be able to do this kind of stuff. 
This is stuff that you're primed or it's potentially available within you. Hopefully you discover it as a new possibility within you, but it's something that's within you. So what's the internal motivation? So internal motivation is what needs to change inside the protagonist. It's the kind of why inside the character. It's like, why do they need to overcome or learn to be a better person? What is it there in their life they need to learn? What is the motivation of this character? Why did that chicken cross the road? It's not just good enough that it wants to cross the road, but why did it want to do it? What was its internal motivation? Um, and I think this one is much, much harder to create and convey effectively. I treat, teach this stuff to my students at uh, NHTV, and this is the one they always struggle with. Because it's easy to say, okay, there's a burning building, there's a puppy inside it, I'm going to go and rescue the puppy. But what is it inside that person that makes them feel that's the right thing to do? What are they going to learn from that? What do they learn about themselves from that action? Maybe it's the first time they've done anything for anyone else in their whole life. And they've always been selfish, and they've had this block that they don't feel like they're worth loving, maybe. And now, suddenly, there's this one little thing, and it's just like, I could do that. And the ice begins to melt, and this change begins. So it's something that I think is harder to do. It's harder to find the right spot for it, but it's really, really important to get it right. So, for example, overcome my inability to express my love to the wife, you may recognize as the plot of Die Hard. <laughs> Because it is, actually. That's really what the plot of Die Hard is really about. From the first scene onwards, it's all about him trying to get back together with his wife, rebuild their relationship, which has got distance in it, and overcoming all these things. The, the, the boss in his wife's office, uh, he gives her this really expensive posh watch that Bruce Willis would never be able to afford on his cop's wage. And it represents everything in her life outside of that. Now, when you shoot the hostage taker, Hans Gruber, Alan Rickman, the fact it was Snape in the building should have been a clue. So Alan Rickman is there, and, is, uh, and when you shoot him off, yeah, sure, you've shot him off. But what else? Holding on to her arm. He's holding there, and Bruce Willis is, is going down to try, try and get her off, and Hans Gruber is holding on to her hand. And he unflicks the watch, and it's the watch that Hans Gruber is holding on to, and, they fall, and he falls away. It's removing that barrier, the one last thing that represented Bruce Willis's distance from his wife is the thing that really defeats the terrorists, that really defeats the threat. It wasn't really about killing the terrorists. It was about getting back together with his wife and learning to be able to express that. That's what that film is actually about. Overcome the grief and loss for my partner. Well, that's Beverly Hills Cop. How do I overcome this? I'm just so angry inside. There's nothing I can do. I'm going to go shoot the fuck out of people. But why? Because I'm hurting inside. Romeo, learn what love really is. Because don't forget, Romeo wasn't in love with Juliet all the time. Romeo was in love with Rosalind. There was somebody else in Romeo's life that he was swooning over at the beginning of it, but he didn't really know what love was. This was just a, a lustful thing he had. And then, of course, Juliet is about learning the value of myself outside the role my family has pushed me into. It's kind of a coming-of-age story. It's a classic, classic story. And it's really about learning that she doesn't have to marry Paris just because her family tell her to. She can be her own person and she can choose who she's loving, loving because she's a growing adult. Overcome my self-doubt that I'm worth anything outside of being a genius engineer. Mm -hmm. Which is feeling worthy of love. That's what that film is really about. And actually that's the only good bit in that film, really. It's actually his, his internal growth. Oh, come on! You've got an enemy that, for some reason, halfway through, is suddenly capable of spitting lava. It's not... His journey, his, his realising that he is something outside of that suit, is the bit that makes that film watchable. Um, Robert Downey Jr. is awesome at doing personal growth stories, cause I, perhaps because he's done them in his own life enough times. Um, but that's really what makes that watchable, and why, why we like Iron Man. One quick word, well, several quick words. Single word motives. Try to avoid a single word motivation, such as fear. What's your internal motivation? Fear. Okay. Uh, love. Good. Um, it's, it's nice as a starting point, but in what way do you need to change? What is love going to change about you? Revenge. That's, that's, even, that's an external motivation. Because about changing the world outside, you're getting revenge on somebody outside you. 
And so it would be paired with an internal, like, overcoming loss. Um, so revenge isn't even internal, but you're, I often see it listed by people when they're trying to work this out the first time. So revenge is not an internal motivation. Um, these kind of single word things don't help you much in your writing process because they're kind of states of being. They're not really changes. They're, there's nothing required to change. You love or you don't. How do you learn from that? How, why do you need love in your life? These are bigger questions and they drive people in the real world. So, internal motivations are about changing how the characters feel inside. Things like learning to feel love. James Bond uh, on Her Majesty's Secret Service. It's a film about James Bond falling in love. It's probably about the only film where James Bond really falls in love. <laughs> Which is interesting. And actually, it kind of puts a lot of the other stuff and all the other things that happen in those films into context when you see that one. It's a nice film. Prince of Persia, Sands of Time, is also about that same thing. Great game. One of the best stories ever told in video games, I think. Learning um, about your adult self, this kind of coming of age story, Stand By Me, classic film. Really, really great film about coming of age. Uh, also, we've got games like The Path, which are about coming of age. Learning to forgive people, Mean Girls. <laughs> it's about how really everybody's horrible, but in the end, we all actually want similar things, and actually we can understand each other better when we talk and communicate and work together. God of War. He's learning to forgive himself, mostly. But that's really what his internal journey is about. It's learning to forgive himself. It's a big, big story in God of War. It's a proper, classic Greek myth kind of stuff. Embracing or releasing grief and moving on. Things like Solaris. God of War. <laughs> <laughs> it is actually about that. It's really, it's, it, he wants to release. He wants to move on. Now, does he succeed? Um... Spiritual philosophical revelation, Shawshank redemption, really about learning who you are and your place in the world and what it actually means to be you. These are big, big topics. And um, <laughs> okay, maybe not Assassin's Creed, um, but I mean, Assassin's Creed really. It, it, it is a story. It starts off as a young man who only cares about himself, but as he grows, he sees he could be the part of something bigger. And he could be something meaningful in the world. And that's an important thing to learn about yourself. Sexual awakening. Teeth. <laughs> Horror movies can do these kind of things as well. If you've not seen it, it's hilarious. It is <laughs> it's really funny. Um, it's got some really dark bits in it. So um, if you have issues with personal or sexual assault and stuff like that, be careful. But it... If you can cope with it, it's a very funny movie. Um, well, I, 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 I don't know about this. I, 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 it's hard to find games about sexual awakening, okay? I, I, I was trying that one. You get the idea, though, I hope. You, you could see that, actually, the games with the best stories are often tackling some quite big internal changes. And I think God of War is a really, really well-told story. So let's fill in a, a little bit here. We've got our external... What do the protagonists want to change the world around them and their status? Often starts with verbs like find, arrest, or save. And the internal is what changes inside them. It often starts with words like overcoming or learning. Okay. So let's move on to a basic plot structure. You've got great characters. Now what? The audience is ready. They want to hear a story. So next I'll go through the part of this, this plot structure that I've been using for a few years. I read lots and lots of books about writing, and this is kind of what I came out with as the most useful way of doing it. And I've been using this in games that I've worked on. Um, start your story before it starts. So what I mean by this is show us the life of the protagonist before things change. Before it all goes horribly wrong, before the, the meteor is about to hit. Show us them driving to work and their relationships with people around them. Show us all the things that make the change that's going to happen seem necessary. To make us like them and perhaps show that life could be better. It's tolerable. It's okay as a life. But there's probably things they're not saying to people who they should probably speak to. There's probably things they should be doing but they're avoiding doing. Prince of Persia does this brilliantly. Um, not only do you have that very, very first scene on the balcony. Uh, the menu of that game starts on the balcony, which is actually the true start of the game. And then the beginning, the first kind of act of it 
is he's there riding across with his father. He doesn't have the dagger of time. He can, he's active. He's, he's a, not a brilliant person. He's young, he's cocky, he's bolshy, he thinks everybody should love him because he's awesome. But he does it. He's okay. Um, so we have this thing called a Save the Cat moment. This is directly from Blake Snyder's books. Um, Save the Cat, really good book about screenwriting. If you want to learn about screenwriting, really, really recommend this. It's not enough to, for your character to be cool. Um, it's not enough for them to just be sexy. It's not enough for them to be just skillful. They must be likable. And that's a really, really difficult thing, because all of those things are great, but you wouldn't want to go for a drink with them afterwards, would you? You'd just kind of go, yeah, you're awesome. I've got nothing to say to you. Uh, <laughs> you want them to be likable. So, so here we have Riggs and Murtar at the start of Lethal Weapon 2, and there's a car bomb. Now, we've seen Lethal Weapon 1, and we see how good Riggs is at defusing bombs. Um, and it's, it's a car bomb in the, in the basement of the police headquarters. And there's a cat on top of the car, and, and uh, he strokes the cat, and goes, okay, red wire, blue wire. Ah, it's the red wire. And he goes, hey, that's the blue wire. Was it blue? Did I say red? I meant blue. I meant blue. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Click. He goes, oh. He goes, yeah, grab the cat. Grab the cat. Grab the cat. And they sprint out of the building as fast as they possibly can. And underneath their arm is the cat. Uh, and then the whole building explodes. They screwed up. They're not cool. They're not particularly sexy here. They're not even skillful. But they are likable. You want them to win. Why? Not only did they kind of had all this stuff wrong, but they saved the cat when they were doing it. <laughs> and it makes them likeable. You, you just have that moment where you kind of go, oh, they crap it all up, but actually they're nice people. And we can relate to that, you know? We can relate to that feeling, because we all fuck up sometimes. We do. And we, we hope that people still have faith in us that we'll recover in the end, and that we'll pull through, because we, we, we hope to be likeable too. Your audience must want them to succeed. That's really what you want for this. So begin with a normal life. Use a save the cat moment. It doesn't have to be literally saving a cat. I should point this out. That one really was. But it doesn't actually have to be that. Okay, so 5% into your plot, we have what we call the inciting incident. Uh, this is something that goes wrong and requires action from the protagonist. You were just an average cop trying to fix your marriage. And then Alan Rickman takes your wife hostage. Um, <laughs> You were just a techie geek with a dead-end job, and then a sexy woman takes you hostage or something like that. Um, <laughs> something changes in your normal life, and you cannot possibly ignore it. Uh, so, for example, you go in, and then you, uh, get, got, you're tricked into pulling the dagger of time out of the hourglass, releasing the sands into the world. You've messed up, probably. If it wasn't you, it's somebody you know and care about has messed up. Um, but you'll probably try to avoid this problem for a while. 25% through our plot, we state the external objective. The protagonists have been trying to uh, avoid dealing with the problem, often due to their own kind of internal block, the thing that they need to change inside. Um, but it's not going away. They now clearly state what they must do. So, for example, Jurassic Park, I'm going to save the kids. That's a fairly st sort of standard thing to do here. Um, it's usually very literally stated by the protagonist. They will actually say, I am going to do this. They know about it. There's no hidden stuff here. The audience also understands that this is a big decision. It usually marks the possibility of the protagonist kind of dealing with their internal block too. They're going to grow up. And also, this happens in Prince of Persia, Sands of Time. It's this moment where he kind of goes, I've screwed this up. Okay, I'm going to try and get the hourglass back. I'm going to try and put the dagger in it. Okay, the low midpoint. Halfway through our story. It seems impossible to, that the protagonist will be able to overcome their problems. It's going to be really difficult. Their first attempt to solve the problem taught them a few things, but it also failed. And their group is breaking apart. If they have good companions, people are losing trust. Wait, no, wrong one. Uh, yeah, there we go. Um, <laughs> How can they ever overcome this? The person that we were trusting, the person who we were believing in, their plan isn't working. Keep on going seems too much to ask. They need to find some hope. And at 75% of the way through, something happens or appears in your story that gives the protagonist hope here. They realize that they can overcome their problems, but they will have to dedicate everything to make that happen. 
Usually been, it's been hard before, but it's not been quite so personal. But the stakes have gone up now. It's getting a lot more difficult. So now they're going to have to risk it all because they must. They have no choice. Before they were trying to get away, they were trying to avoid it, they were trying to solve it, but they were doing it the safe way. Now the safe way hasn't worked and there's no options left. Click, there we go. So Samwise, yes, he had abandoned Frodo, but now he's found that thing and he's gone, no, no, I must go back. And it's Samwise's faith that goes back to save, to save Frodo when he's been kidnapped by the orcs and stung by the spider and it's all going horribly wrong. How could he possibly get out of this? Only if Stam Samwise grows, if he learns that he can be a hero too, can you get out past this. Morpheus, the one person who means that the revolution will be okay as long as he's alive, has been kidnapped by the agents and he's been kept at the top of a building, secured by dozens of army people. How are we going to solve that? Guns. <laughs> Lots of guns. And so that's what they do. They know it's a suicide mission, but it's worth it. It's worth trying it. That's the, you've got that little, slim, little, little sliver of hope there, and you're going to try and make it through. But it goes to the black moment. This is the, the, the writing term for it. It seemed like such a good idea, uh, but it's not paid off. Um, the hope of completing that external objective is completely gone. All seems lost. Alan Rickman has a, white, a gun to your wife's head. <laughs> it could have been a wand, it could have been a gun. Who can tell with Alan Rickman? Um, he's going to cut her heart out with a spoon. Uh, Frodo has turned back from the flames. The temptation was too much. He's too corrupted by the ring. He must now take on the mantle and become the new Dark Lord. Neo is killed by Agent Smith. That's pretty bad as far as things go, you know. <laughs> um, hey! Uh, it, it, it's a pretty serious situation for your lead character if they die. Um, how can it ever be overcome? How can we possibly do anything about this? And if you've not played The Prince of Persia Sands of Time, yep, trust me, this does happen too in that game as well. I'm not going to spoil it. It's a brilliant, brilliant story. You have the resolution. The ingenuity you've been forced to develop lets you hide a gun. It's really hard to see in this picture because it's a very dark bit of the film, but using Christmas wrapping tape, he stuck a gun to his back. Um, or the friendship that you've built and the creature you saved helps you out. Don't you let go, Mr. Frodo. Um, and and it's, it's not just Samwise here saving him. It's also that Gollum takes the ring, and he's the one who carries it into the flames in the end. The one creature that Frodo took pity on, the creature that nobody else wanted to save along the way, is the creature that makes the difference in the end. Kindness wins through. Love wins through. And that's a great way to end any story. Love overcomes fear, which is basically the end of The Matrix. Because even though Neo is the one... He needs the love of Trinity. She needs to overcome her internal block about being able to accept that she can love. In this world which is destitute, there's no food, there's, it's, it all tastes like chicken apparently. Um, <laughs> it, it, there's nothing there. There's no hope for the future. And she needs to find that there is a possibility of hope. And she finds hope through love. And when she accepts that, when she gets there, she knows that he must be the one. And it's her love that actually gives him the power, arguably. It's what brings him back from the dead. He's a pretty good guy. <laughs> so things long, learnt along the journey turn out to be the essential elements that help the protagonist in their darkest moment. Those things they've learnt, those little bits they picked up, I know Kung Fu, um, are the things that come through and pay off in the end. And then you finish your story as fast as you possibly can. Here we go, how long does my ending need to be? As short as you could possibly do it in a satisfying way. So, tolerable life before a problem. Inciting instance, something goes wrong. Protagonist tries to live with it, tries to avoid it, but in the end, they have to face up to it. They state their external objective. The protagonist tries to solve the problem in a safe way, but it doesn't usually work. I mean, running away from a dangerous situation. Ah, there's a T-Rex. In the end, you know you're going to have to go back to the center, and it's all going to go horribly wrong. Um, low midpoint. Uh, they first try fixing the, pl the, the plan didn't work. The group's falling apart. Trust is being dismantled. The problem was not fixed, the situation has become worse, it seems really problematic here, but then hope, something happens, some internal change that gives the protagonist hope they can overcome the problem, if they risk everything. 
I was watching this last night, and the, the love interest in Cowboys and Aliens is dead, but she comes back. Um, it becomes clear that Dangerous Idea might work if they're really dedicated to it. The whole group reconciles about that mutual goal. They know it's a last-ditch effort. They've got no other choice. Uh, training, equipping, power-up, montage. You need a montage. It's great. Um, then the black moment. It looks like the risks won't pay off. And then finally, though, the story is resolved quickly and in a satisfying manner. Cool. So we've got our plot. Um, Mixed success and failure at the end. Satisfying manner. You've got two objectives. You've got your internal, uh, sorry, external and internal. So do they have both succeed to get a good story? No. No, they really don't. So satisfying endings are different. Mix them up. The story must conclude in a satisfying manner. This may be successful completion of the external and internal motivations, which gives you a happy ending. Die hard. Killed the terrorists, got back together with a wife. Working out pretty well here. Um, or it may be failure of the external motivation, but a success of the internal. Uh, so it's very common in comedies or tales of self-discovery. Rocky, he doesn't win the fight, but he learns his own value. He learns to trust himself, and he learns that he loves his wife. It's a good thing. Or it could be success of external motivation and failure of the internal, which often happens in tragedy. Chronicles of Riddick, sure, he doesn't save the girl, but he, be he becomes the empire. He's got rid of all the people chasing him. But it's a tragedy, because internally, that love he was trying for is lost. King Lear, another classic tragedy. He's grown as a person, but everything is lost. Uh, don't end with failure of both external and internal motivation. There is no change there. If you don't succeed in one of these, it sucks. This means a character failed to grow or succeed at, or at anything. And it makes your audience wonder why they spent time with that character at all. And you don't want that at the end of your story. So a brief word about scenes and failure. Make failure a regular event in your story. Every scene you write should try and have the protagonist wanting something. This is their objective. Something stops them, there's conflict. And they must take action to overcome this or find a new direction, which is the outcome. If a protagonist goes into a scene and succeeds at everything, then the scene is uninteresting. That may sound kind of familiar to you. So, objective, go blow up that satellite dish. <laughs> mission accomplished, good job. That's basically the plot of most uh, video game kind of missions. Uh, yeah. uh, that, that's, that's what most video game missions do do, but it's really uh, g getting in a kind of way here. So let's do per scene. We've got our objective, conflict, outcome. This is going to be our final thing. This will be on the final slide in a moment if you want to take photos. So, three failures of a success. I'm actually going to skip past this one, but trust me, it works. Because um, I've got another speaker coming up in just a few minutes. So let the character in your games fail. Player success does not have to equal character success. So keep the story rolling while the player character fails. So this is, this is the lead character from Aliens vs. Predator. In the first mission, the rookie needs to reset the power to help his squad. They do it. They go there. They reset the power. But that makes everything much worse for the character. It doesn't make it worse for the player. The player has succeeded whilst the character fails. And it makes the story better. So... When creating missions, make the character and the player think they're doing the right thing, and then let that assumption be wrong. But let the character fail while the player succeeds. And you can tell better stories that way. So a fragment of him, um, alongside my professorship at NHTV University, I'm collaborating with Dutch developer Sassybot um, to create fragments of him. So this is a, a kind of playable interactive narrative experience, as I said. Uh, four lead characters go through a journey of love, grief, memory, and hope. It's an emotional journey. It really is. Uh, very simple play. Like I say, it could be a puzzle if you want to call it that. And it uses the plot structure I've explained today completely throughout the whole thing. More information about that game, fragmentsofhim.com, and announcements about this pine are going to be coming out over the summer, so watch out. Coming to news near you. In conclusion, storytelling is a craft just like making games. Now, you all know how difficult making games is. It's going to take practice here. To learn to write well, it takes the tools and then practice. So these things I've been explaining today, knowing these basics isn't cheating. It's just like learning any tool of a trade. You just need to learn how these things work and practice with them. Good motivations, solid plot structure, and scenes full of conflict are the key to successful stories. So if you're already writing, hopefully this has given you a way to examine the stories that don't work. Sometimes you go, why isn't this working? Maybe your character hasn't failed enough. Maybe your story hasn't got complicated enough. Seriously, make them fail as much as possible, pretty, pretty much in every single scene. Because if it works the first time, it's not interesting. 
And if you're just starting to write, I hope this gives you a way to begin building on strong foundations, give you a good overview of how to kind of start about this stuff. If you get any of my tips from today in your work, please drop me a line. I'd love to hear about it. My Twitter's on the next page. Um, please go make great games and tell great stories. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you.